Jakarta has been uh, consistently number one uh, in number of total cases, and it is still in the top five uh, number of daily new cases in Indonesia. So how do you respond to that? Looking at new cases is good, but looking at active cases is better. And I think that's where one should look at. Number two is look at positivity rate. Before we decided to do a transitions, we look at those indicators. Are the epidemiology indicators showing that Jakarta is improving? If it is a yes, then a relaxation is an option. Number two, is positivity rate below 10% because that's what's required by the WHO. And if it is a yes, then relaxation is an option. And on both, Jakarta answer is yes. So even that uh, our number on the positive uh, of the new cases is high, uh, one need to look at how many people is being tested. And after uh, June the 4th, after we started to do a transitions, we double our testing. And when we're doing testing, we're not doing random testing. We're doing purposive testing. Purposive meaning we're doing tracing. And then we found uh, probable cases. And then we're doing testing on those probable cases. So with that, Jakarta positivity rate in the past, ma- past week is 4.5%, while the national uh, positivity rate is around 11%. So we are health of the positivity rate at the national level. The daily new cases in Jakarta this number is until the 10th of, of June, it remains stable. And if you look at, if you compare to outside Jakarta, the trend is very different. So yes, we still have cases. It's not uh, yet ending. However, uh, we have those number relatively under control compared to uh, the situations in April. But, uh, you mentioned that uh, now the positivity rate in Jakarta has been below 5% for the past week, right? Just to confirm. Yeah. Because the previous weeks, uh, it, it is still above 5%. Uh, in the past week, we are below uh, 5%. Uh, on the let me check on the 15 we are 3.5 uh, 3.3 and then only on the 16 we are 5.1 and then 4.7 and then 4.4 so the average the average is below 5% and today uh, we just got the the rate the, is 4.3%. That's the positivity rate uh, of the report today. We, we are required by uh, the rules of uh, WHO to be under 10%. And we are definitely under 10%. Ideally, it is below 5%. So if you want to reach ideal, it's below 5%. But, you know, we are way below 10%. And, and this is comparable to any major cities uh, in advanced countries. So Jakarta, we're grateful with 41 labs working together and able to handle more than 5,000 samples every day. And I must say that this is a collective work. It is not only work done by one, two institutions. Without the spirit of uh, collective work, we will not be able to reach where we are today. Uh, So I'm grateful with that. And and I must give credits to everyone 
who are involved uh, in this endeavor. And one one more thing that is uh, that is needed uh, here is often we overlook the fact that healthcare system uh, are they being prepared or not uh, to tackle this pandemic. In March, we had only eight hospitals for uh, COVID, referral hospitals. Uh, today, we have 67 uh, hospitals for COVID. And, and today, uh, we have more than 4,500 beds. And we have 600 more than 650 ICUs. That is no small work. If we are not improve and increase our testing capacity, if we are not improve and increase our healthcare system for treatment, as governor, I will not enter transition. Because I we have to we have to be able to trace, to track, and to treat if the people get uh, exposed to COVID nineteen. But because we're able to do our testing doubled, and we're able to prepare healthcare facility health facilities in large number, and then we're seeing the reproduction number under control. We are seeing positivity rate under control. You look at all those numbers, then we are say, okay, now we're able uh, to do transitions. So I feel like uh, being in a, in, a, in a pilot cockpit, looking at all those indicators before deciding uh, to take off or to do landing. And we're grateful that through collective work, including uh, the work of our citizens, the hero of those graphics going down is the people of Jakarta that have decided to stay home. Uh, those are true hero. But Anis, are you saying that um, Jakarta is prepared, like have enough uh, testing capacity right now, have enough hospital beds and also ventilators? And despite the deaths of many of our uh, health uh, workers, uh, do we now have enough um, health workers uh, to face this uh, transitional period? Oh, yeah, yeah. If, if uh, knock on wood, if the so-called second wave is coming, what do you think? That in, in March end of March, early April. At that time, I told our team, imagine if we have 6,000 cases coming up in the same week, can we handle them? And all of us said, we have 190 hospital, but we don't have the management to handle them. So I called uh, a consulting firm, Corn Ferry, to come and help us to design a management system to manage patients in a large number coming in simultaneously or at the same time. So they work in two, in two weeks to produce a system to manage a flow of patients in a large number. And they're doing it pro bono. I call them, you know, I said, Jakarta is calling for your help. We are, we are not overwhelmed with the COVID-19 pandemic and we need you to give us the help of creating a system. And this, that system is able to connect all hospitals in an under single management of COVID-19. So at first we, we, we sort of in a, in a quote, uh, required 40 hospitals to enter our system and they were hesitant. At that time, many hospitals don't want to get involved with COVID-19. Created that system in, in April and 
Now it's not only 40 hospital. Now it's 67 hospital. And those hospitals were integrated in its systems, including inventory of medical supplies. So uh, now we are able to detect how many uh, APD is still available in a certain hospital. Uh, they ha will have a stock for a week or two weeks or a few days. All supplies were also being monitored, all medical supplies, including medical workers, uh, all under one uh, management system. Did that uh, in April, and now we've, we, we enjoy the benefit of that uh, because now we're able to sort of prepare ourselves if cases are continuing. So uh, it is not surprising when when the uh, when the uh, Fakultas Kesehatan Masyarakat Universitas Indonesia uh, they were doing scoring for our facility. What happened is they give us a score of one to one hundred. Uh, Jakarta is scored one hundred. And I've been saying to so many people, uh, we are writing history. It is not for today. It is for the next few weeks, next few months. Then we will be able to look back and, and, and found out that, look, we're doing the right thing. That's why I said three, the three T is an, I mean it, improve testing capacity, increase tracing by active case finding, and improve treatment facility. If those three were done, we're good. This change in, in a healthcare system, uh, is, is it also extends to non-COVID uh, situation? Because um, if, if like there's a lot of COVID-19 uh, cases, uh, many, many experts in healthcare facilities say that it will, it will increase the burden in the non-COVID, right? Uh, so, so just to be clear, if for example I'm a Jakartan, I go to a hospital uh, to uh, because I have non-COVID uh, illness in an emergency room, and then this this particular hospital is is uh, don't have any beds. Can this hospital help me and tell me where to go? For example, like yeah, like uh, opening some kind of like a digital data, like you said system uh, and then tell me okay the next nearest hospital that has a bed for you is this hospital for example is is that system allow does the system allow me as a patient to have that kind of surface planning yeah yeah uh, for that kind of surface we had it uh, long ago so if you come to hospital and then uh, you have say uh, you have complained about uh, digestion problems and then you need to be treated, you can be referred to a specific hospital. But that's, that's normal and we have that system already. If you have same cases of COVID at the number of 6,000, how do you manage that? <laughs> because our system is designed to handle single cases individual problems, not collective problems. So the change is more for COVID-19? Yeah, the, it's not a change, it's an additional uh, feature. So we created a separate system only for COVID and only linked to 67 hospital, not include the 190 hospital. The 190 hospital is for all kinds of disease. I'll give you an illustration. If a patient come to a puskesmas and then uh, found positive and need uh, a, a treatment in the hospital, then the puskesmas look at the system and they know where to send. And if, for example, if someone come to Rumah Sakit Pasar Minggu uh, with positive case and Pasar Minggu, let's say, is already full, then Rumah Sakit Pasar Minggu knows where to refer without making phone calls here and there because uh, the system already direct them 
where uh, to go. So the idea is uh, to expedite referral at the time of crisis. Uh, now we are not at the time of crisis because cases were coming uh, in a you know you 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 can you can count the numbers uh, uh, easily and now I mean it's not like a in a number of tens of hundreds uh, per day so hospitals were now quite relaxed in a way I was talking about uh, imp- the improvement of our uh, testing capacity. But that's not the end of the story. Capacity is one thing. Speed is another. You can do 5,000 testing, but if it takes two weeks uh, for the public to get the result, then that's meaningless. So speed matters. We used to be around nine days from the and from the receiving samples to result. Now, we are around two days. In fact, we're 1.7, if I'm not mistaken. So, ini lama proses PCR test. From nine to now, around one to two days. So, this helps to expedite treatment and to make sure that Everyone come into our health facility is able to be treated expeditiously and get you know the, the proper uh, treatment without waiting for so long. Uh, and again, this is a long process. This is in March, and this is in uh, we reach around two uh, per day by mid May. And since then, we're around uh, 48 hours. WHO standards is between 24 to 48 hours. And we are uh, in that uh, level. So I must say, if you are in Jakarta, inshallah, the system is able to take care of you. Mm. And and in fact, uh, every next week, I'll be uh, meeting uh, international community in Jakarta. And the message I'll be telling them is, you know, good that you're not going home because you may be in a safer city in Jakarta than, you, than you're going home uh, in the past few months. And this is our approach. At least this is my approach to tell them the good news after all the work is done instead of telling the plan of what go- what's going to be done. Because this is about saving soul. I, you know, I, I told our team, when people, when we are facing pandemic and we have people coming into our hospital, the options is only two. At the end, they'll be going back home, recovery, or to cemetery, and we don't want people to go to cemetery. We want people to be to go through the route of recovery, and for that, uh, focus on the right thing and focus on lesson learned from other places. So the system that we have now uh, intact is work of a lot of people in the past two months, and the the result uh, started to be seen by mid may and therefore we have the confidence to start transitions by early june panis i think this will be my last question it has been two weeks after pace baby transition being implemented how's the evaluation pa well you just saw the number uh a positivity rate is around five percent and hospital is 100% ready. So here is the, here's the catch. When we started a transition, the hypothesis goes like this. People started to leave their home. 
probability of uh, viral reproduction increase. So we may be seeing a jump on the new cases, new patients, and so far, the past two weeks, we have not seen that. One, we did not see a jump after mudik, which we were very worried. Two, we have not seen a jump after the transitions. Is it enough to conclude that uh, we should go uh, full normal? No. <laughs> I think we, uh, it, is still, it is too risky uh, uh, to decide. We still have to wait. We're going to wait until end of June. And if in end of June we're seeing the number similar to this, then we start our second phase transition. So uh, I'm on this. I'm a bit conservative. It is better to be uh, more cautious. It is better to uh, start to relax uh, to do relax uh, relaxations much slower rather than to do it faster and seeing uh, more new cases. And, and I must say uh, that during the transitions, we are also adopting staging process. Because if you look at the way we relax our uh, social distancing measure is we started with house of worship and then we started with uh, office and all of that need to be less than 50% of capacity. And then after 10 days, we started with shopping centers and markets. So there are stages and I must also uh, extend my appreciation to the people of Jakarta, to the, to the management of the malls, of the stores, that aware of the risk and willing to set up procedures within their work, within their shop, within their malls, to make sure that the workers were safe, the shoppers were safe and the public as well uh, they are not they're not uh, too enthusiastic in going to shopping centers uh, I'm, I'm looking at the numbers now after the shopping centers were open occupancy rates were only around 17% so people are in the social media said, I want to, udah pengen nge mall, udah pengen ngafe. You know, uh, that's only in the social media. But when the cafe is open, when the malls are open, they said, mm, it's too risky. I'll stay home. <laughs> so uh, apparently uh, the public also understand about risk. Jadi evaluasinya, uh, epidemiology number shows we're under control. Health facility, not overwhelmed. We don't see a jump on the number of patients. And then uh, public arena, uh, we're also not experiencing a jump. If you see malls uh, with 50% occupancy, then we're worried. But if it's only 17%, then it's, it's, it's normal. It's, that's the stage we should be. 